Welcome to the Capital News. I'm your host, Alex Caritas. Today is January 14th, 2020. Thank you so much for joining me. A few stories we're going to touch upon today include market performance, the U.S.-China trade phase one deal, whatever's in it, we still have no idea. The signing ceremony is supposed to take place tomorrow on January 15th. So we're going to have some commentary on that. Of course, we've been talking about this oh, almost since the beginning of this podcast last February with a little bit more frequency as of late because now there is, I guess, some sort of deal. There is going to be a formal signing ceremony uh, tomorrow. So we're going to talk about this. The Democrats debated this evening. There were six Democratic contenders for the presidency on the stage this evening in Iowa, 20 days before caucus goers go out and cast their vote. So we got to talk about that because 2020 is going to be heating up. Six major candidates left on the stage. This, of course, will start to get whittled down over the coming months. So we're going to provide some analysis there. We have some news on the impeachment front. Finally, the articles of impeachment are scheduled to go to the U.S. Senate for trial tomorrow as well. So is this political jockeying that Donald Trump, the same day that he is going to have his signing ceremony, is the same day that the articles of impeachment are going to be passed on to the United States Senate? What we are told by Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky that the trial will begin next week, very possibly starting next Tuesday. There is still a lot of questions as to the rules. What's going to happen? Is there going to be a senator, most likely a Republican senator? Are they going to move to acquit, move to dismiss all charges against President Donald J. Trump? We're going to have to wait and see. Well, we are starting to see some reporting out there, or there is a handful of Republicans, about four or five Republican senators, who are saying, you know what, we want this to be a fair and open process. We want documents. We want witnesses. This is not just going to be a rubber stamp. This is not just going to be down partisan lines. And whether or not you think this impeachment inquiry, this impeachment investigation, this whole process, the trial, if you, if you agree with it, if you think it's a sham, if you're somewhere in the middle, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, this is our Constitution. This is the process. And the process has to be respected and it has to be honored. We were talking yesterday how we are on a slippery slope when the president of the United States is going to come out on Twitter and basically say, who cares what the narrative is when it comes to the killing and the assassination of the Iranian general Qasem Soleimani? Who cares if it was an imminent attack or not? He was a bad guy. I don't have to reach out to Congress for approval. I don't have to do any of this. I have all of this power vested in me through Article 2 of the Constitution, and I just don't give a damn. That is an extremely dangerous precedent. That is an extremely dangerous thing for any president of the United States to say. That is the exact reason why this republic was founded. So we do not have that type of individual at the helm. That's why we have a government, a constitution, that is built on checks and balances. That's why the war powers are vested in Article 1, which is the Congress, which by extension is the people, because it's going to be the people who are fighting the war. Not a king, not a queen, not a president. That's why those war powers are vested in the Congress, not in the presidency. And for him to go around, on Twitter of course, and to make such a statement, who cares? Who cares? He was a bad guy, he's gone now. That's true. He was a bad guy and he is gone now. But we do have this thing, Mr. President, called the Constitution of the United States. We do have this thing here in the United States called checks and balances. And that's exactly how it's supposed to work. It's a slippery slope, ladies and gentlemen. Very slippery slope. This is dangerous rhetoric. Believe me when I tell you. Okay? You have to open your eyes and ears to this type of rhetoric. Not because you like him. Not because he's a Republican. Okay, you can't just side with somebody because you voted for him. I voted for Donald Trump. I, I'm not going to vote for him again. He needs to go. He really does. He has a moral obligation as the leader of this country, as all presidents do, as I said, stated this yesterday as well. And this is going to be a common theme throughout 2020 during this entire presidential campaign, no matter what happens. He has to rise above the divisiveness. He's had three years to do it. He has not. 
He is not. He has an obligation, a moral obligation as far as I'm concerned, as the leader of the free world, as the leader of the United States of America, to get people out of their silos, to tone down the rhetoric, and to unite this country. Not to get in the mud, not to get in the gutter, not to, not to sling and hurl insult after insult after insult. No matter what you think of Nancy Pelosi, and I do not think of this woman in high regard, to come out and say she's going to go down in history as one of the worst speakers ever. Okay, you, We have a lot of things to get done. That type of language, that type of rhetoric is not going to get anything done. And it's no better on the Democrat side either. But that's the problem. He's supposed to be the president of the United States. He's top dog. Okay, He's the ambassador of the United States to the rest of the world. He's supposed to rise to the occasion. He is not doing so. He's not doing so. In fact, he's setting a very dangerous precedent that is allowing other Republicans and other Democrats to just continue to come up. Well, if he's going to say it, so am I. I told you the fish rots from the head down. It's a question of leadership or a lack thereof. And I've stated this multiple times on this podcast, and I'm going to say it here again. The only people on this planet who are showing any type of leadership are the people who are protesting around the world, who are sick and tired of the fraud, the, the corruption, the nepotism, the thievery of their money. They're sick and tired of it, and they're standing up finally for themselves and for their families and for their countrymen. Those are the only leaders on this planet right now. It's not in Washington, D.C. It's not in the Oval Office. It's not at the Federal Reserve or any other central bank. It's not in Congress. It's not in the Democratic Party. It's not in the Republican Party. It's, it's, it's nowhere to be found except in those people taking to the streets, and we're going to see how successful they are, and I hope they are very successful in getting what they want, at least overturning a lot of this corruption and nepotism, because it needs to happen. It needs to take place here in this country as well. These global protests are not transitory. They're history in the making. They continue to go on. The only thing that now starts to sort of deviate is how much media coverage we see here in the United States. That's why you got to go on the internet. That's why you got to read a whole bunch of things. You can't just sit at home and watch Fox News or CNN or MSNBC all day. You got to go online. You got to read articles. You got to watch some YouTube videos or whatever, you know, site you're going to use find for, for independent journalism and media because they're still talking about it. These people are still protesting. These, st these issues are still front and center to millions and millions of people on this planet, if not billions. Okay. So you have to understand this. So when you have a president who takes to Twitter to basically say, who cares? He was a bad guy. He's gone. I don't need to notify anybody of anything. I'm going to do what I want. Can't do it. Can't do it. And that goes to the crux of my argument when it comes to this impeachment. Will the president do this again? Yes, he will. Because this is his M.O. He has shown us what he would do. Said it yesterday, I've said it many times here before in our many podcasts where we did this analysis. When you have Bob Mueller coming out and saying that our report does not exonerate the president, but we are going to honor the, the precedent that exists within the Department of Justice that you cannot indict a sitting president of the United States, we're going to honor that precedent. But our report does not exonerate the president of the United States. Attorney General Bill Barr, who was appointed by the president in regards to the Mueller investigation said that that report does not exonerate the president of the United States. But Thunder Thumbs takes to Twitter and says, I've been exonerated. Okay, this is basically the July 24th when Bob Mueller comes out, testifies. The next day, President Trump is on the phone with President Zelensky of the Ukraine. Hey, can you do us a favor? Can you look into this company? Of course, that meant Burisma. And can you look into the Bidens, Joe Biden and Hunter Biden? Because there's something up there. Okay? This isn't 2017. This isn't 2018. This was in 2019. If this was such an issue, if this was such a concern of corruption and U.S. dollars going to another country for foreign aid and military aid, well, why didn't you raise these issues, Mr. President, in 2017 or in 2018? Why did you conveniently wait until Joe Biden was in the race to ask these questions? And now there's some news coming out today from Lev Parnas, who was one of the associates of Rudy Giuliani, who was arrested by the FBI, who I sta stated months ago is going to be somebody who might start singing like a canary because he might throw the president under the bus. A whole bunch of people want to be loyal to the president. This guy Maybe not so much. Maybe he wants to sing like a canary. Well, his documents 
have been subpoenaed by the House of Representatives. Those documents, at least some of them, have been released to the House of Representatives. And now they are going to become a part of the record when it comes to impeachment. And who knows what's going to come out. There's probably a lot of documents in there. Some of them have been reported on, you know, some hand scribbled notes from Lev Parnas saying, you know, you got to get, you got to convince the president that you got to convince uh, President Zelensky of the Ukraine to come out and, and say that they're going to be investigating the Biden, yada, yada, yada. There's a formal letter from Rudy Giuliani acting as the personal and private counsel for the president of the United States saying, look, I am trying to meet with you, President Zelensky. I only need a half hour of your time, but we have things to discuss, yada, yada, yada. Okay. And he has the consent of his client, the president of the United States, to reach out and to schedule this meeting. To discuss what? What was going to be discussed? What was the purpose of this meeting? Okay, there's other things out there because we still don't know all of the arrangements, all of the details when it comes to how the trial is going to take place in the U.S. Senate. There is some speculation that another personal attorney of Donald J. Trump's, Jay Sekulow, who I'm sure many of you are aware of, he goes on uh, pretty much all of the news stations, Jay Sekulow may also have been aware of these meetings, may also have been there. So I don't know how you're going to have the person representing the president also being a fact witness of the investigation. So there's a lot of information that is still unknown. And that and that goes to the question as to why the president, if he's so sure of himself, if he has exculpatory evidence or if he has witnesses that he could put forward in his defense to truly exonerate him in his administration, then why doesn't he put them forward and so we can end this charade if that's in fact what it is? based on the facts that have thus far been released, that are in the record, the witnesses who have thus far testified, as far as I'm concerned, shows that there was wrongdoing by the President of the United States, that there was an abuse of power, that he should not have done what he did. And there is not a single Republican who comes out and says as much. They're all on board. It was a perfect phone call. Everything's fine, yada, yada, yada. At least if the president would have admitted, yeah, you know what, maybe I overstepped here or there. Forgive me, I'm not going to do this again. Let's move forward. We got XYZ to take care of, blah, blah, blah. Maybe the American people would have moved past it. But nope, Donald Trump has to dig in, has to say it was a perfect phone call, nothing bad took place, blah, 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 blah. That's not the case. That's not the case. And we walked through this witness by witness, and we went through a lot of the documents. Now, clearly, there's going to be thousands and thousands of pages when it comes to the testimony. But the starting, uh, the starting documents, the whistleblower, the IG, all of that, all of that, we went through and we read it because we said that is going to be important because if you're just going to listen to Fox News, you're going to hear one side of the story. If you're just going to listen to CNN or MSNBC, you're just going to hear the other side. So we're going to take the time and we're going to go through all those documents. We're going to take a deep breath. We're going to use logic and reasoning and common sense to connect the dots. Not, not emotion, not whether you like the president, not whether you despise him, just the facts. What did they tell us? It wasn't good. It wasn't good. Because remember, I was never going out and after this president from the get-go. I said from the get-go when these documents first came out, I said, well, you know, when this phone call was released and we read the transcripts here, I said, I don't think that in and of itself rises to an impeachable offense, but... There's no doubt about it in my mind that this was not a spontaneous phone call. That means there was a lead up to this phone call. That means there was conversations. That means there was interactions between members of the administration and maybe with Ukraine or others as to how to go about this phone call. That there was going to be a backstory. And that's what called for an investigation. I said, I'm fine with that. Because we cannot have a president, no matter who or she is, abusing their power. So when Donald Trump claims that he was exonerated by the Bob Mueller investigation. He then goes out and does what he does and did with President Zelensky. Now, if he becomes exonerated through a trial in the United States Senate, how do you think he's going to feel after that? It's just like, look, I got away with it again. I was exonerated by Bob Mueller in his mind, and that's all that matters is what's going on in his mind. He doesn't care about anything else. So whatever's going on upstairs is what he's concerned about. So he's exonerated, as far as he's concerned, from the Bob Mueller investigation. He might be exonerated or at least acquitted 
from the U.S. Senate trial. He's already talking about who cares about reaching out to Congress or this, that, or the other, any type of process. Soleimani was a bad guy. I wanted him dead. That's it. Very dangerous. How emboldened do you think he will feel if he is acquitted by the United States Senate? I think quite emboldened. And what will he do with that extra gravitas or confidence that might be in his step because he thinks he's above all of it? Well, your guess is as good as mine, but I can tell you it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty. So, is that really what Nancy Pelosi was waiting for all of this time? Was she just waiting to hold these articles of impeachment so she could release them on the same day that there is supposed to be this signing ceremony in Washington, D.C. in regards to the U.S.-China phase one trade deal? Who knows? But it's about time. It's about time. And we're going to have to wait and see what happens with Lev Parnas because there was the uh, because th th these documents first went to the House Intelligence Committee, which committee which is where uh, Adam Schiff is the chairman, Devin Nunez is the ranking member. So these documents were would have been reviewed by those individuals and maybe other members of that committee. It has then been passed forward to Jerry Nadler, the Democrat of the House Judiciary Committee. In that letter from Adam Schiff to Jerry Nadler, it states that there are a couple flash drives. One is basically declassified, if you will, and the other one has to remain sealed due to the information that's on it. Will that ever be released? Who knows what's in it, what's on it? I mean, I think we have to pretty much hear and see everything. I mean, who's Lev Parnas? Why would he have classified information? You know what I'm saying? Who is this guy? He was an associate of Rudy Giuliani who has been arrested by the FBI. So we need to know what's going on here. Just like we need to know what was going on with the intelligence that led to the quote-unquote imminent, the imminent threat, the imminent attack that was going to take place somewhere in the Middle East in regards to U.S. interests. We need to know what's going on because we cannot afford to be lied to again into another war that's going to cost billions, if not trillions of dollars with no end game, no end in sight, Flag draped coffins coming back of young people, mothers, fathers, sons, and daughters. We can't have it. We cannot have it. And slowly but surely, this administration has been sending more and more U.S. personnel, hardware, you name it, to the region in the Middle East. And I told you, the more people you have, the more likely it is that something's going to go wrong. If you have 15,000 U.S forces over there, you have 15,000 targets. Something can go wrong. If you have nobody over there, you have no targets. You get the math? So that's that. The impeachment, we're going to keep you updated on that. I mean, it is going to be a wild week in Washington, D.C. Tomorrow with the U.S. trade ceremony, signing ceremony. I mean, again, unless there is some sort of surprise, President Xi of China is not going to be here. It's going to be Vice Premier Li He, who's going to be here, who has been the head of all of these Chinese trade delegations back and forth, back and forth for a year and a half. And again, China is not increasing or removing their import quotas. So when it comes to all of these agricultural purchases, maybe they'll buy them from the United States. Maybe they won't. We don't know, and we know that China now, miraculously, is no longer a currency manipulator. Well, just like that, we're going to have a signing ceremony, and boom, China is no longer manipulating their currency. Wow, what a coincidence. Huh. Unbelievable. This is embarrassing to the United States of America. This, is embarrass this should be embarrassing to the President of the United States. There's no real enforcement mechanism to this whole thing either to hold the Chinese feet to the fire to continue to buy U.S. agricultural products. They've already started sourcing the supply elsewhere. Russia, Brazil, Argentina, other countries, like we told you they were going to, because they got 1.4 billion mouths to feed. It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer that they were going to go source that supply elsewhere, and that's exactly what they did. And it's exactly what they continue to do. Now we have the news out today from the administration that some of the tariffs are going to remain in effect until after the 2020 presidential election. Well, no surprise. We've been talking about that here for months. At the very least, they have to remain on. 
even though there's really no strong enforcement mechanism, you still at least have to keep the appearance that there's something there on the other side, that Donald Trump and the administration can at least appear to be the strong man and say, oh no, if you're not going to start buying at a certain rate, soybeans, corn, pork bellies, whatever it is, well, we're going to threaten you with more tariffs. And are we going to have to play this game for the next 10 months now too, like we did for the past 18? Up, oh, threaten tariffs, market goes down. Up, oh, they're gone. Up, oh, now up they go. Up, oh, we're going to threaten them. Up, oh, down goes the markets. Oh, we're going to remove them. Up, oh, up go the markets. We have to play this market manipulation game again. You know how much money can be made by somebody who has inside information on this? You want to investigate something. You want to impeach them on something. There it is. Market manipulation. It's a crime. Talking about the stock market like this, pinpointing certain U.S. companies that comprise the major averages, the major indices. It's, it, again, it's a very dangerous precedent. Because I can assure you to my Republican friends out there, if this was Barack Obama, you'd be going ballistic. You'd be going ballistic. This is market manipulation. How dare he? I told you he was a communist or socialist trying to get his fingers into everything. Stay out of it. But your guy, he's a Republican. He can say and do whatever he wants. That's the problem, folks. That's the problem. The house divided cannot stand. It's all hypocrisy. Everybody's becoming a politician. You have to rise above it. You have to. Now... We'll see what happens with the signing ceremony. We'll see how well the president does in soaking up as much airtime as he possibly can so people don't pay attention to the fact that the articles of impeachment are going to be sent over to the Senate. We'll see. President Trump is pretty much a master of that. you got to give the man credit where credit's due. So we'll see how much airtime he eats up talking about that. Uh, still... Still, at this moment, at this very hour, at this very minute, we do not have details of this deal. Nor are they expected to be released. Wow, it's the greatest deal ever. Wouldn't you think the president would want that released? I mean, every detail of it. It's the best thing ever. It's like a trophy. Something to showcase. Something to tell everybody about. Well, what are the details, Mr. President? Well, blah, 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 blah. we're not going to know. We're not going to know. And are they going to be realistic? Again, the Chinese basically have two years to make good on it. Well, maybe Donald Trump will be the president then, or maybe he won't be. Is another administration going to be there? Is Donald Trump going to change his mind? I mean, there are so many unknowns, and this does not check them off at all. At all. So if you have all of these surveys that we have been citing here recently with the CFOs concerned that there's going to be a slowdown or we're already in a slowdown in 2020 that could turn into a recession, about what, over 90 percent of them. And you got all these other surveys, manufacturing and industrial surveys out there, and they, they want to use an excuse just like everybody else does. It's human nature to look for an external factor to point the finger at them. Well, they all cite tariffs in trade uncertainty. Well, you're going to continue to have trade uncertainty for the remainder of this year. No question about it. This isn't going to solve a thing. And even if the U.S. Senate finally passes the USMCA, which is NAFTA 2.0, that's not a panacea either. You don't just sign something. It's not a light switch. You don't just flip the switch and boom, all these jobs come back if that's even going to happen. So there is going to be a lot of uncertainty that continues to make its way through 2020. Like we have been saying here for the past year. It's most definitely going to continue. We continue to see valuations, and we talked about this yesterday too. We are starting to see a multitude of valuations when it comes to the stock market that are at 2000, the year 2000, the dot-com era level. Or exceeding it. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it. I mean, it's not like this is 1929. It was the year 2000. This was 20 years ago. People have already forgotten. And now you have other reports coming out today. When it comes to this Federal Reserve and the repo madness and them getting involved with these markets on an overnight basis, well, they might start giving money to hedge funds so that the hedge funds can take care of it. 
Are you kidding me? You know what that is? I mean, that's another, that's another bailout, which is what they're doing anyway. It's probably what they're doing now, giving it to hedge funds. But now they're just trying to work out the kinks, and now they're just getting the messaging out there so they can get the communication going. Basically giving hedge funds money for nothing so they can go out and speculate in the market. What could possibly go wrong? This is basically halfway, the halfway point of the Federal Reserve coming out and just outright purchasing stocks. They're not supposed to do that. Other central banks do that. The Swiss National Bank, they, they own, I think, about $100 billion worth of U.S. stocks. A lot of it concentrated with, you can guess the names, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, those big names. Which, by the way, those five stocks, the FANG stocks, they comprise almost 20% of the U.S. stock market. 20% in five companies. Does that sound like free market capitalism to you? That also exceeds the dot-com era, where you had that type of concentration. It's now more heavily concentrated today in the tech sector than it was during the dot-com era in 2000. We have hundreds, thousands, and thousands of companies in this country, and five of them, five of them, represent almost a fifth of the stock market average. What could possibly go wrong? The risk-reward on this is just not to my liking. That's why I say stay diversified and stay vigilant. Because now you got a lot of people jumping into this market, panic buying, fear of missing out, FOMO, all that stuff. Get me in, get me in, buy anything, buy anything. I don't care about the valuations. I don't care about the price. Just get me in there. That is extremely dangerous. Can this continue going? It sure can, especially when you have the Federal Reserve continuing to prime the pump and to inject liquidity, inject liquidity into the system, tens of billions of dollars on a nightly basis, if not $100 billion. And again, that's slated to continue quite possibly, quite possibly until April. And I wouldn't be surprised in the least if that happens, and I wouldn't be surprised in the least if it continues. And we'll know in a couple weeks because there's going to be a Federal Open Market Committee meeting. So we're going to kickstart that off in a couple weeks. So we're going to see what the Federal Reserve has been thinking about. Hmm. So now to the Democratic debate this evening. Nothing surprising here. It was pretty low key. Nobody really attacked or went after anybody. Joe Biden is still the front runner. Uh, you know, it's a different thing because it's a caucus as, as opposed to just your sort of, you know, outright vote. So there's a process to it. So I don't think anybody wanted to rock the boat. They just wanted to stay in their, you know, respective lanes and then just see what happens from that. Uh, somebody's going to have to break away from the pack sooner or later. It might be through Iowa, might be through New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina. But pretty much by the time we get through Nevada, South Carolina, we're probably going to whittle it down to probably uh, maybe three or four candidates from that point, I would imagine. Unless there are some surprises and maybe each, each you know, maybe there's one candidate that wins each respective state, then you're going to have a little bit more of a horse race. But time will tell. Major theme that continues throughout, although, of course, it's a lot easier to hear what these candidates have to say because there's not 12 of them on stage anymore. Oh, and Spartacus is gone. I'm sure you've heard that. Oh, well, what a surprise. Spartacus is gone. Poor fella. Poor fella. But he's gone. Cory Booker is gone. Um, free stuff. It's all free stuff. Medicare for all. Child care for everybody. Everything's free. Public universities free for everybody. One candidate, I think, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, well, yeah, it's free, but only up to a point. There's going to be means testing. So if you're a rich kid, you got to pay up. But everybody else, it's free. Where, where's all the money coming from? Nobody can explain to me how they're going to pay for all of this stuff. Of course, they make up phony numbers and they say, well, if we just tax the rich people. You could take every dime of these individuals and you're not going to come close. It's just basic math. Okay, you can look at the Forbes 500, you can find all the Americans in there, you can add it up, and you're not even going to come close to funding these outrageous programs. Not even close. Then they want to talk about health care, which we've talked about here many, many times before. I don't understand for the life of me why any individual with two functioning brain cells to rub together would want politicians meddling in something as personal 
is health care. What is more personal than your health or that of your spouse or your children or a loved one? Not much, if anything. I mean, to my Democratic friends out there, do you honestly think that the Democrats are always going to have power, that they're always going to have the presidency, the House and the Senate? Because right now they don't. They just have the House. Likewise, to my Republican friends out there who think that they have all the answers and all the solutions and think that it's their party that is supposed to put forth these plans. Because remember, it wasn't that long ago when President Donald Trump said the Republican Party is going to be the party of health care. And I said, oh, no, that cannot happen. That cannot happen. I mean, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm a libertarian. So to the Republicans out there who think they have the solutions, do you think that the presidency, the House, and the Senate are always going to be in control by the Republicans? No, because that's not the case now either. You have the presidency and you have the Senate, but you don't have the House. So what this means logically is that health care is always going to be a political football so long as it is in the hands of politicians. Because, say for example, you have a Democrat. And that party, the Democratic Party, is in control of the House, the Senate, and the presidency, and they can push through their health care policies. Well, it's only a matter of time before the Republicans gain back the House or the Senate or both and or the presidency. They get all three. And then they're going to say, look, we ran, you elected us because we didn't like the Democrats, Democrats' plan on health care and all their policies. We're going to undo them all, and boom, now they all get undone. You know who's in the middle of all of this, don't you? You! You are! And guess who keeps paying the bill for all of this nonsense? You! You do. So it, this is beyond me. How people who don't trust politicians somehow want politicians to manage their health care or to put forth policies that are going to affect the most personal of issues. It's just beyond me. I cannot explain this. I have yet to come across somebody who can explain this to me. I mean, you should be able to, this, this logic, a toddler can come up with this logic. And then it's going to cost us trillions and trillions of dollars to do it and then to undo it and then to redo it and then to appeal it again and go back and forth. Then it's got to go to the Supreme Court and blah, 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 blah. Then it's going to be fought again. Well, we just got to tweak it. When's it going to end? When's it going to end? And all of these politicians on the stage tonight, they all go after the greedy, the greedy capitalists, the greedy corporations. And there's no question, there's no question. That there, are that there are greedy people in the pharmaceutical industry, in the healthcare industry, yup, ba, 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 ba. No question about it. But guess what? They can have as many lobbyists as they want. They can send as much money as they want to politicians, to political action committees, this, that, and the other. They can write as many bills as they want to. But they're not the ones casting the vote. They're not the ones saying I or nay. It's the politicians. So all of these Democrats are up there saying these corporations got to get out of the system. No, it's the corrupt politicians who have to stand up and say enough's enough. You put forward policies. Now, not on this issue, obviously, but you get my point. These corporations are just going to Washington, D.C. because that's where all the money is. We talk about this in my book, The Cynic's Guide to Investing. They're just going after the money. The federal government spends $4 trillion. Well, hell, if I can spend maybe 50000 here or 100000 there and lobby this guy or put a little cash in his pocket to run for this office, maybe I'll get something in return. This is a failure of our system. This is a failure of morality. This is corruption. This is what people around the world are protesting, except here in the United States, where the amount of corruption... Oh my God, I could only imagine what the total number is, but it's probably the size of developed countries. I mean, our budget of $4 trillion would be one of the largest economies in the world in and of itself. Our budget deficit of $1.2 trillion is one of the largest 
countries in the world in and of itself, our deficit. So can you imagine the amount of corruption and abuse that exists within our system? And we want to point the finger at Iranians or the Nigerians or the Venezuelans. They couldn't dream of having the type of cash that we're throwing around. It's unbelievable. And here are the Democrats. Let's just give it all away. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That's why I still hold, if President Trump can get through and be acquitted, he's probably going to pull it off, folks. He's probably going to continue to win because this is what the Democrats are going to do in most of this country, and rightly so, is not ready, and we should never be ready for these types of policies. But everything's free. We're just going to tax this, that, and the other. The math doesn't work. The numbers don't work. And the policies are un-American. So that's it. We're going to have a wild week in Washington. U.S.-China trade deal, phase one, whatever that is, is going to be signed tomorrow. The Democrats debated tonight. Iowa caucuses 20 days away. Articles of impeachment move to the Senate. The trial is set to begin next week. Do we have a canary about to sing with Lev Parnas? I told you 2020 was going to be interesting. The circus is alive and well. Get your popcorn ready. Thank you so much for joining me today, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure having you. As always, please like, share, subscribe, get the word out, leave your comments. We do love hearing from you. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capital News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.